There's no time. All right, you guys, we're back once again. This is episode 116, the one after the Halloween episode. Yeah. Um, I'm glad that you guys really seem to enjoy the Halloween episode. We got like a lot of really cool comments about that, so I yeah. really appreciate it. Like I said, apologies again, and a couple of you I contacted, you know, that I couldn't uh, read some of your stuff on there because it was too long and stuff. So again, I apologize for that. Yeah, it'd have been like a nine-hour show. It probably would have been, yeah. Um, actually, somebody made a suggestion that maybe we should do like another offshoot show that is just like reader submissions, like fiction or nonfiction or something like that. That's actually a good idea. Really. I, I actually did think that was a good idea because every time we do one of those, it seems like really popular. Um, and we always get like a lot of really good submissions. So we might look into doing that in the future. I mean, we've already got three shows a week. Yeah, might as well yeah. have a fourth one. <laughs> it's going to depend on Patreon support. I mean, it would really have to, because look at how much that eats into book production. Yeah, true. All right. I mean, we, we um, we're still trying to get the audio book out for uh, Faces Villain Two. Yeah, it's recorded and she hasn't gotten through the uh, the editing yet. Yeah, because it well, it's no it's, time to edit. Yeah, and, it just takes so long, and it's like you know we have so much other stuff going on that it's like. And I, uh, Jenny's uh, graphic design demands have just skyrocketed. You know, she's got these new clients that want her to design all these packages. Here's some badass packages too, and we got some free product too. Where is that? Yeah, Man, it's show right that. Behind. Show well, that. Show that it, thing. Get it. Man, this stuff here. <laughs> I never had this flavor. Oh, it's good. But the mint, the mint flavor was really good. Now this is actually a different. This isn't matcha tea. This is actually turmeric. Yeah. A uh, base type of tea, and you can also make golden milk with it. Yeah. But yeah, they have a hibiscus flavor and a chocolate fa flavor. Um, I actually at one of the meetings where we were doing the uh, package design, you know, when we were yeah. kind of throwing around ideas for it, um, I actually they let me try both flavors, and they are both fantastic. They're yeah. seriously, they're delicious. Um, cause I, you know, I love turmeric type stuff. So it actually did kind of taste like, it actually kind of tastes like a Thai soup or something like that. Yeah. That but, one, um, that one mint that you had, I made like an ice, yeah. an ice tea with it. Yeah. With cream and uh, I think sugar and a bunch of ice and it came out kind of green. And man, it was good. I, yeah. It, their matcha it's line. It's almost kind of like a shake. Yeah. Their matcha line, I think they have like uh, seven different flavors, but actually the mint yeah. is my favorite. Stuff's not cheap either. That That's it. There's expensive. Well, no, it's good stuff. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? This stuff, I mean, the matcha is like sourced from Japan. It's like all really yeah. uh, high quality stuff. So, you know, Healing Butterfly, if you want to go check them out. Yeah. I and do, she also uh, makes like the hard, the boxes. These come in hard boxes too. Yeah. So. I do this a lot of all their packaging right. pretty much. So you should go check them out. They have an Amazon store and whatnot. Uh, let's see what else. Let's do our last uh, movie review, which was the weird 2001 serial killer supernatural mystery frailty, uh, which is on Shutter at the yeah. moment. If you want to go watch it, it was kind of like a weird. I, I guess it was kind of like an off the wall sort of choice, but maybe not because I guess it's kind of like an. People underrated. seem to like it. Yeah, yeah, and it's like a lot of people are like, "Oh man, it's a forgotten it's, classic." Yeah, really. it really is. It's like you know, so and. So we, we like to do ones that are kind of cult classics or ones that are kind of a little bit forgotten about. So go check that out if you haven't already. I want to see that other one that was kind of like it, the one about the apocalypse. I haven't seen that the one rapture. forever. The Rapture. Rapture. I haven't seen that in forever. I think people have forgot about that yeah. one even more. Like what if frailty. the Rapture did happen? What if right. the apocalypse was happening? Because I remember that yeah. one not being so much a horror movie. That was kind of more an apocalyptic drama, I want to call it. Yeah. Was it, it a horror movie? I don't remember uh, it being kinda, a horror movie. Kind of. It was kind of spooky it because elements. it was kind of spooky because you're you're approaching the you're approaching it as if, you know, apocalyptic, you know, uh, uh, apocalyptic religious beliefs are bullshit. That's right. how you're approaching it. But then all of a sudden you go, "Wait, no, no, this is happening. This is happening." Yeah. <laughs> you know. It was a weird movie. Yeah. I haven't seen it in a long time. I saw it many, many years ago, but I it, I remembered it. It made an impression. I remember kind of what happened in it. But yeah, we should actually try to seek that yeah, out. Yeah, it was like a, actually like a good version of uh, of what was that Arnold Schwarzenegger movie that is terrible. Oh, what uh, the hell was the name of it? Seventh Sign or Seventh End of Days. End of Days. Yeah, yeah. End of Days. One or of the, no. Yeah, End of yeah. Days. One of the worst Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. I told you it was bad. You didn't I mean, it, it, was, it wasn't as bad as collateral the damage, theater. though. I saw it in the theater. My ex-husband dragged me to see it. It wasn't as bad as... <laughs> I gotta, I'm going to do a show on the worst of Arnold. And I'm a huge Arnold Schwarzenegger fan, but man, there's well, that, then that's Well, you, then you're the one you sh who should do it because, you have, so, because yeah. you have so much love for him that yeah. you're not just going to like shit on him for no, no reason. 
you know. I'm gonna tell you why that there was bad Arnold. There was there was really bad Arnold. There was. Yeah. Well, I think most actors that have been around as long as he's you're gonna do some bad movies. You're gonna do some. It's just inevitable. You might as well just lean into it because it's gonna happen. I hate to tell you, Arnold is good. Actors out there. Arnold is good in sci-fi fantasy. That's what I think. Yeah. And, and things you know, like Conan, fantasy type. And like I said, now that Terminator. he's, now that he's older and can right. actually play a normal person instead of like a, an ubermensch or like yeah. kind of like a superhero type character, yeah. um, I definitely feel like he's got acting chops. Like he can act like a normal person when yeah. given the role. But I don't think he would have been able to do that when he was younger. Yeah, it's time for him to come up with some weird shit. I wanted to do King Conan. Maybe they might get to that. Yeah, I wanted to do King Conan. They might get to that. Yeah. And I think the only other thing, um, like I said, check out our latest uh, matinee review, which was episode four. Uh, kind of had a strange conglomeration of movies this past week. It was like the end of October, and we yeah, were kind of like scraping was... up the... We were just like, what can we yeah. see without you know, having to see A Star is Born? Because I really don't, don't want to see that. But um, we ended up... Actually, the, the movies we saw were actually... Not uh, as bad as I was expecting. We ended up seeing Small what? Feet. Can't can't would turn out to be pretty all right. I really liked Small Foot. Actually, they were all okay. Yeah, they were all okay. Hunter Killer was all right. Was okay. uh, yeah. Johnny English Strikes Again. That was yeah. the other one we watched. The, like British spy movie with Rowan Atkinson. That was yeah. like it was pretty entertaining. Um, this week I think will be better because there's more movies that we actually were really excited about coming out. Saw Suspiria. Already. Yeah, Suspiria. Uh, I think Bohemian Rhapsody, yeah. and uh, we got to pick another one for this week too. But that'll be the one that'll come out next week. So we won't uh, spoil it by saying what we thought about because we saw Suspiria already. Um, so anyway, let's see what else. Oh, um, I also recorded a, an interview with Adam Sane from Conspiranormal, the people over at our friends over at Conspiranormal. Uh, this was actually another true crime show because Faceless Villain 2 is so long. Uh, we actually did, I was on there once like talking about crimes from the 1960s and this one we were actually talking about crimes from the 1970s. So um, I don't know if it's going to be up by the time this show goes up, but I'll put a link if, if it is. And if it's not, then I'll put a link whenever it does come out. Um, and also on their uh, Patreon page, there will be like a bonus material of just of, you know, of Tom and me and uh, just talking about random shit. So, <laughs> like Hellraiser yeah. and various other things. Bolsonaro. <clears throat> and stuff like yeah. that. So, check that out uh, if you have t- the time or the inclination. And speaking of Patreon, uh, obviously, as I say every time, if you want to support the show, you can go to our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash 13 o'clock pod- co- 13 o'clock. 13, 13 o'clock, o'clock. podcast. Yeah. Oops, that was a Freudian slip. Yeah. But yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 13 o'clock it's yeah. like when it comes around mm-hmm. all the way around up to the top and a little bit past the like top. A little, it's, it's like leaning little, to the side like 13 that. o'clock merry go round merry, merry go round <laughs> that's exactly the carousel what <laughs> okay that's exactly what it but i yeah. was going to say uh our latest patreon donor whose name is justin so thank you yeah. very much justin another heavy hitter also yeah. we had a a fan named Jason who made a very generous PayPal donation this past week. So thank you very much. I didn't know about that You one. guys. Yeah, yeah, oh, I okay. told you. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I tell him things and he forgets. Yeah. It just goes in one ear and out the other. So anyway, uh, today, again, since we did like kind of paranormal or creepy shit on the last show, which was the Halloween episode, this time I'm going to go back and do some true crime. Now, yeah. these two cases were both uh, separately requested by various people. And these are actually two cases that I've actually been interested in for a very long time. And the first of these is not necessarily, it's true crime, but it's, uh, there. there's one murder, maybe, although it might not be a murder. Now there was an attempted murder, um, but mostly this is just like a weird, crazy, convoluted, like unsolved mystery. And actually I first heard about this case on Unsolved Mysteries back in the 1990s. They did a they did um, a partial episode about this, and I just actually just watched it. I think even when they redid the show with Dennis Farina, they repackaged this segment because this was actually one of their most famous segments. Just this case is just so fucking bizarre. So uh, it's known as the Circleville Writer Case or the Circleville Letters. Uh, so we'll get into that in the first half of the show, and then in the last half of the show, I'm going to be talking about a more standard true crime thing, an uncaught serial killer, and kind of one that flew under the radar in the 1970s, known as the doodler, or the black doodler, hmm. who has never been caught. 
So, and both of these kind of started in the 1970s. So we're going with the 70s true crime theme on this episode. Waka, 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 waka. Yeah, make yeah, some yeah, like that's a wow, chicka wow, 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 seventies wow, wow. Thank you, that was very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so let's start talking about now. I I gave you a little bit of a rundown of kind of the main points. Yeah, of this I don't know much about case. this case. I'm kind of like just the experimental stand-in for the for the audience. If I don't understand it, maybe they don't understand it. You know, it depends on how smart they are. <laughs> Half of them probably smarter than me, but. <laughs> Well, the law of averages would there dictate. You go. I'm just Mr. Average. <laughs> Mr. Average. That sounds like a nice little song. Like perhaps by they might be giants. But yes. anyway, okay. So let's talk yeah. about the Circleville writer case. And like I said, this uh, this has a lot of moving parts, and there's a lot of like kind of really bizarre shit going on with this. So I'm going to try and keep it all straight for you guys. Most of you might have heard of it because, like I said, it kind of got a lot of traction in the 1990s when it was on Unsolved Mysteries, one of their famous uh, segments. So this started sometime uh, either in late 1976 or early 1977. There's this little town called Circleville, Ohio, about 25 miles outside of Columbus. Kind of a small town, only about 14,000 people live there. You know, one of those places you don't lock your doors and all this other kind of stuff. Well, beginning in, like I said, late 76, early 1977, various people around the town start getting these very strange and threatening letters. Now, most of them are written in this kind of block text like someone's trying to disguise their handwriting like they're writing in all caps and they're just writing in like these weird block letters now a lot of the letters like some of them are very you know vulgar they've like swearing um a lot of them seem to know private details about the people that the letters are um targeted toward and like i said i think over the course of this and this was a, a something that went on for you know many many years um i think over the course of this thing like about a thousand letters were sent now they call it circleville writer um i think it's more than one person but we'll get into that a little bit later on so even though a lot of people around the town had gotten these letters the people that seemed to be targeted particularly was this woman named mary gillespie now mary gillespie was a school bus driver Now, sometime in 1976 or early 1977, she received a threatening letter that basically said, I know about your affair with the superintendent of schools, whose name was Gordon Massey, and you need to knock that shit off or else something bad's going to happen. They they were threats, pretty much. Now, she got, I'm not sure how many of these letters that she got. Um, I think the Unsolved Mysteries episode said it was two, but it might have been more than that. I've never seen any sources saying exactly how many she got. She kept them a secret from her husband, Ron. She just kind of like ignored them, even though some of them uh, seemed to threaten her daughter, who was 12 years old at the time. So she kept it under wraps. But then the husband, Ron Gillespie, he got one as well. Mm. And this letter said... Go like you need to go to the school board and report your wife's affair with the superintendent of schools or else something bad's going to happen to you. You know, let him, it was threatening his life, essentially. Hmm. So at this point, OK, so Ron says, what the hell is this all about? Uh, Mary says, that's a lie. I'm not having an affair with that guy. I don't know what the hell this is all about. So at this stage, I mean they they decide to contact don't think they initially went to the police the first thing they did was they kind of contacted um their family members at this point this was like ron's sister karen and her husband paul and they kind of like invited them over to the house and like what do you make of all this and let him let them read some of the letters so there was no affair uh, we'll get we into that. Know, okay, we'll okay, get into okay. that a little bit all later. Right, all right, okay. Like I said, this and is just the beginning. Thickens, and the plot. Thickens. Oh, the plot's gonna thicken a lot. Okay, okay. This this shit just gets weirder and weirder. Right. They you couldn't have written something like this in a novel and people would believe it. It's you wouldn't buy it. So they're discussing the shit with their family members now. I think that in a lot of kind of. Um, things that I've seen about the Circleville writer case, especially stuff that's not real in depth about it. It's just kind of like a, you know, like a little, you know, summary of it. Um, They generally say, oh, they all had these big block letters. 
But what a lot of sources that I kind of, once I kind of went down the rabbit hole, they're like, no, there were actually two different kinds of letters. There were the block lettery ones. And then there were some that had some kind of more normal looking handwriting, but were signed with a W. Because it should be noted that the block letter ones, there was obviously no return address. They were not signed. Um, the only thing that was on the envelope was a postmark. And the postmark was from Columbus, Ohio, which, as I said, was 25 miles away from Circleville which is, you know, where all of the people that were targeted by these letters uh, lived. So this is somebody mailing stuff from Columbus, but knows all this intrigue about people that are going on in this little town 25 miles away. So the family gets together and I'm not sure. Now they thought they knew who the letter writer was. Now I've seen some sources say that uh, Gordon Massey, who was the superintendent of schools, who Mary Gillespie was supposedly having an affair with, he had a teenage son named William. So they were thinking that maybe William had written some of the letters, particularly the ones signed with the W, because, I mean, it was his dad having an affair, so maybe he would have some kind of motive for doing that. Now, evidently, they decided that they were going to send a bunch of letters. They were going to write letters, presumably to William, but I'm not uh, entirely sure about that. Like different sources say different things. If I'm not sure if that's who they suspected or if it was someone else. But so whoever it was they suspected, they're like, okay, well, we're going to write them letters, not threatening him, but saying, look, we know who you are and you need to knock it off. So they wrote like four or five letters to this person that they suspected of being the letter writer. Now, this did actually kind of seem to work because the letters seemed to kind of, you know, go. I don't know if they stopped entirely, but they did kind of like, you know, there weren't as many of them showing up. So this all kind of went, you know, the letters kind of went fallow and stuff like that. But then comes August 19th, 1977. Now, Mary Gillespie is out of town. She is on vacation in Florida along with Karen, who is um, her sister-in-law, and two other women. Now, allegedly, she has been going down to Florida and she's going to meet Gordon Massey, who she denied, you know, having an affair with him, like, from the start. But no one buys that. Everybody thinks she really was having an affair with him the whole entire time. But like I said, I'll get into that a little bit later. So she's down in Florida with her girlfriends now, her husband, Ron, is at home. According to the children, he gets a phone call. And the phone call is presumably from the letter writer. Nobody knows what this person said on the phone. But it pissed Ron off mightily. He says to his kids, I'm going to go get this guy. He gets his gun and he goes and he gets in his pickup truck and he takes off. A short time later... Ron is found dead in his pickup truck at an intersection not far away. The truck has hit a tree. What? And has and he's dead. Okay. Now, his gun has been discharged one okay. time, All they right. think, but they never did find the bullet casing or anything like that. They didn't see where the bullet went. They're not entirely sure when it was fired, but they think it was sometime after he left the house. Weird. They also find that his blood alcohol level is 0.16, which his kids think is very strange because they said, you know, he didn't really drink either at all or all that often. Um, and he didn't seem to be drunk when he left. Could it have been an error? Um, it could have been, but I'm not really sure. So in any case, like I said, Mary Gillespie and them are out of town. They're in Florida. She's ostensibly boinking someone else. Well, hold on, hold on one what? second. I'm trying to picture this crime scene here or this accident scene. He's at an intersection and the car is rammed into a tree? Yep. Now, was this a particularly dangerous intersection? Did he, no, nobody saw this? Not that I know of. Not that Did, I ever saw. Was there any evidence that he was driven off the road? Not that I ever saw. He must have acted so mad he just ran off the road. It's possible. I'm, I'm kind of leaning toward because, see, the, the thing is, like, all this weird shit that happened later has led to some people saying, well, that was murder. But I'm not entirely sure about that. Might have been an accident. It might have been. So in any way, so Ron Gillespie is dead, right? Because his truck has hit a tree. So 
they, you know, during the investigation, like initially they thought, oh, well, maybe it's foul play. And they kind of like um, talked to a suspect about it. But after that suspect was released, then it seemed like most of the authorities said, no, it wasn't foul play. It was just an accident. You know, he was drunk and he was angry because this person had called. And, you know, so evidently he just ran off the road because he was drunk and mad. So that's kind of where they left it. Now, after that happened, you know, there were still like more letters coming and all this other kind of shit. And this kind of went on for years and years. Now, interestingly, after Ron died in the accident, then Mary Gillespie came out and said, yes, I am sleeping with, um, with Gordon Massey, but we didn't start our relationship until after the letters had started arriving, oh, which I, I don't it. buy that. Actually, nobody buys that. Yeah. I think it was kind of just a way for her to save face. I mean, at that point, her reputation had already been ruined because everybody heard about, I mean, she still had her job and everything like that, but you know, everybody knew about the letters and the, you know, the accusations of the affair and stuff like that. So I think she was just trying to save face. She's like, oh, my husband is dead now. At that point, Gordon Massey had divorced his wife. So, you know, so they could date and it wouldn't be like a big deal. But I don't, but I think she was having an affair with him the whole entire time. Some kind of connection with And that. was just trying to, yeah. Some kind of connection with the women in this story. Yeah. This guy was either watching her or was watching the other guy's wife. Yeah. And he found out about it that way. Something weird going on. Yeah, like I said, and it gets he knows weirder. Him. It gets weirder. He's got to know him. Well, yeah, because he knew like a lot of intimate yeah. details about their kind of stuff. Now, like I said, the, some of the letters were sent to other people in the city, to like city council members, um, you know, various other people in the school system, and seemed to know shit about them as well. So, but like I said, the Gillespie family seemed to be the main target of the ire. Okay, so now that the affair is out in the open, now. In 1983, which as I said, this is many years later. This, these letters have been kind of going on this whole time. In 1983, Mary Gillespie, as I said, she's a school bus driver and she's been a school bus driver this whole entire time. She's driving her route. She's driving kids home from school in her bus. It's about 3.30 PM. She sees a sign that's like uh, tied to a fence post or a sign post that is directly threatening her daughter. Like I said, a lot of the um, the letters threatened her daughter that said that she was going to shoot her daughter in the head if various things didn't happen. Um, I believe some sources said that other signs had popped up before that threatening the daughter. And sometimes before Ron Gillespie died, he would get up really early and drive around town and take these signs down so that other kids or other people wouldn't see them. So this wasn't the first time that this had happened. But so she's driving down the street at 3.30 in the afternoon. She sees a sign that's directly threatening her child. So she pulls the bus over and she pulls the sign off the fence post. Now the, the sign has been put on there with like twine. Also attached to the fence post with the same twine is a box. She opens up the box and the twine is also tied to the um, trigger of a 25 caliber pistol that is inside the box. It is essentially a crude booby trap that was ostensibly supposed to go off when she either pulled the sign off the fence post or when she opened the box. The gun did not go off. But this, like I said, attempted murder, right? Because this is uh, was obviously meant for her. I mean, it was meant for on her bus route and shit like that. So the pistol has had its um, serial numbers partially filed off but whoever did this didn't do a very good job of it. So when they take the pistol into police custody, they are able to get a serial number off of the pistol. Yeah, and in case you guys don't know how this is done, I'm going to clue you guys in on some cool shit. <laughs> Usually a uh, pistol serial number or any kind of serial number on a firearm has uh, been kind of roll stamped in there. All right. So when that happens, this is it's used. To, it's a machine that's kind of punching the metal in to form that number. When it does that, the metal's more dense there. So there's certain kind of acids you can brush on there and it'll eat things away except the highly dense metal where it's been punched so the numbers start coming, start to become visible. Pretty neat, huh? Yeah. Because it's dent more dense there. So that's how they do that. Uh, filing a number down won't do it. You can file it pretty much all the way down and that density of that punch is 
prevalent, deep, deep into that metal. The only way is to drill it out. Yeah, well, that was not through. done. And like I said, yeah. I don't even think it was completely filed off. Like I said, yeah. whoever did it did kind of a piss poor job. Yeah, just trying to, um, yeah. And I have some theories about why that might be. Probably to frame somebody else. Yeah, that's that's very, uh, that's kind of what I'm leaning toward. Yeah. So they they find the, the uh, serial number of the gun and they trace the gun back to um, Ron's brother-in-law. Ron was the one that got killed in the car accident, you remember? This is Ron's brother-in-law, Paul Freshour. Now he was one of the first guys that they showed the letters to, right? It's his gun. So they ask him and they're like, look, um, he's like, I didn't, why would I wanna kill Mary Gillespie? Um, you know, why would I wanna do that? It, even though the gun was his, but he said, yeah, but I used to keep it in the garage and I haven't even looked at it or checked on it in a really long time. Who the fuck knows? Somebody could have broken it and taken it. It's like, you know, a million things could have happened. So it sounded bullshitty, but they, I mean, they arrested him anyway. And then they're like, okay, well, if this was your gun and you set up the sign and the booby trap and everything like that, then you must also be the Circleville letter writer. So here's the dumb thing. The fucking sheriff, whose name was Ratcliffe, he does a quote unquote handwriting analysis where he basically tells Paul Freshour, here are some of the Circleville letter letters, copy them as closely as you can. So Paul's like, okay. So then he like writes them out and he's like, aha, you're the Circleville writer because you tried to make it like, like cause like I said, they were block letters. Right. So this, besides this like dumbest handwriting analysis ever. <laughs> so Paul Freshour is arrested for attempted murder. Now he's not arrested. Um, he's not charged with uh, writing the letters, which would be harassment and various other things and stalking and whatnot. Um, he's not arrested for that. But at his trial, they are allowed to introduce them as evidence as though he has written them, even though he denied writing them. He said, the only letters that I wrote he said, were the ones that we wrote, we wrote four or five letters to the person that we suspected of being the Circleville writer, you know, at the beginning of this whole brouhaha. Yeah. He's like, I did write those, but yeah. he's like, those weren't threatening. We just said, hey, we know who you are and knock it off. That's about all we said. Cops and lawyers sometimes left on their own do some crazy shit. Man. Well, I kind of feel like, and I don't, you know, I don't and, know. Um, and you you can't trust lawyers at all either. They're, they're, well, they I all, don't. I kind of feel like the sheriff was kind of behind a lot of this yeah. stuff. I don't know if it's, if I buy like a lot of the conspiracy theory stuff, but for sure, I think he was just looking for a suspect and wanted to put the whole thing behind him. And he's just like, yeah, you did it, whatever. Yeah. So essentially, so Paul Freshour, even though, so basically they're like, okay, so they used the letters against him, even though there was this whole dumb thing and they couldn't prove that he had actually written them and he denied writing them. Even, and the gun was his, even though he said, look, it's been in my garage forever. I didn't even know it was gone. I don't ever, I don't shoot it. I don't have any ammo for it. They actually searched his house and they found nothing that would have had, they didn't find any twine, they didn't find any ammunition for the gun, anything that would have suspect, you know, that would have made you suspect that he had made the the bomb or whatever, or the uh, booby trap or whatever. So they didn't find anything. His fingerprints were not on any of the letters, his fingerprints were not on the gun, nothing. But yet, he was still convicted Damn. of attempted murder. Seven to 25 years. It's ridiculous. Right. I tell you, you know, just to make things clear to the audience, Given a choice between the average cop and the average lawyer, I'd trust the average cop over the average lawyer any any day. I wouldn't trust either one of them. No, nah, <laughs> the average cop at least he's a, he's a, tends tends to be kind of just a reasonable regular guy. The average lawyer a lot of times tends to be kind of idealistic and got something to prove and trying to make a name and it's just uh, lawyers, lawyers and cops. But you gotta have you gotta have cops at least, and I guess you have to have lawyers. Well, yeah. Just because uh, I wouldn't want to def have yeah. to defend myself lawyers, if I ever got in trouble. Lawyers are the you know. <laughs> I don't think I do too well. <laughs> lawyers are the modern secular version of a, of the priest class, really. You know, writing magical spells to make things to come to fruition in the real world. You know, they're like sorcerers. <laughs> so here's the yeah. thing: Paul Freshour is put in prison. Now you would think that had he been the Circleville writer that the letters would stop once he went to prison, they did not. So obviously it wasn't him. But the sheriff was so still convinced that it was him 
that he was still saying, no, he's somehow sending them from prison or he's like having them smuggled out, even though the warden of the prison was like, there's no way. It's like, we took away all his writing materials. We even, they put him in solitary confinement and all this other, there's like, there's no way that he could be writing these letters because the letters ramped up after he went to prison. Hmm. So there's that whole thing going on too. So there's like, there's no way that he could be writing them. And plus it should be noted too, that the Circleville letters, every single one of them was postmarked Columbus, Ohio. And Paul Freshour was in prison in a town called Lima, 90 miles away. So they're like, there's just, there's no way. So he's sitting there in jail. Meanwhile, the letters are still coming. In fact, Paul Freshour gets a letter from the Circleville writer himself. And it says, hmm. now when are you going to believe you aren't going to get out of there? I told you two years ago, when we set them up, they stay set up. Don't you listen at all? It said that. So he got his own hmm. letter that said that. So obviously this is, like I said, a frame up. Now, in 1990, Paul Freshour comes up for parole. Even though he has been a model prisoner, uh, the sheriff is able to say, oh, well, the letters kept coming, and obviously it's still him, so you can't let him out. So they didn't. So he stayed in. He didn't get out on parole until 1994. <laughs> he had been in prison for 10 years. False charges, yeah. Yeah. This is some bullshit right here. That's what I'm saying, man. I don't trust lawyers. Now, see, the thing about Paul Freshour, mm -hmm. I not only do really, really, I really do not think, I mean, he passed away in 2012. If you want to go, he, uh, uh, if you do like a search Paul Freshour Circleville letters or something like that, he actually, after he got out of prison, he put up this big website. Um, I think it's like 164 pages. I kind of skimmed through, I read some of it. He was trying to get the FBI involved and he was like, you know, talking about all these things that had been, um, you know, not admitted at his trial that would have probably gotten him off and all this yeah. other stuff. Now, a lot of the stuff, some of the stuff that he said on there was a little far fetched. Like, um, you know, he was saying the sheriff was like uh, complicit in like covering up murders and various other things. So, so I think he went a little far, but some of the shit um, I kind of bought, like I, I could buy that he kind of got railroaded into this kind of shit. Because check this shit out. Later on, um, there was like a an independent, like an investigative journalist. And he got interested in this case. His name was uh, Martin Yant, I think. And he was the one that brought the case to the attention of Unsolved Mysteries. So he started working on the case, started interviewing people that had to do with it and everything, started interviewing Paul Freshour. They started working together. And what they discovered was that there had been some stuff that had not been brought out at Paul Freshour's trial. The main thing that had not come out was that on the day that the, that Mary Gillespie found the booby trap on her bus route, there was another witness that said that 20 minutes before Mary Gillespie found it, that this other bus driver saw somebody standing by the fence post, a man and a yellow El Camino. Hmm. And that he looked like he was doing something, but like he tried to like not show his face like he was peeing or something. And they said they thought that was very weird. Now, this b other bus driver described this person as like a sandy haired, like a blonde man, which is not what Paul Freshour looked like. Also, Paul Freshour did not have a yellow El Camino. Yeah, hard to hide an El Camino. But guess who did? Hmm. Paul Freshour's ex-wife, because Paul Freshour and Karen Freshour had divorced hmm. um, in 1982. Her brother had a yellow El Camino. And the guy standing by the fence post looked a lot like her current boyfriend. Hmm. So they didn't say that at the trial. And the interesting thing too, is that the whole accusations of Paul Freshour being the Circleville writer, Karen didn't start saying that until after the divorce. Because in the divorce, Paul Freshour got the house and the kids. Hmm. So some people are thinking, here's the thing. I'm kind of going to go, let me go a little bit down here, like I said. Now, Paul Freshour, he has since passed away. Uh, he passed away in 2012, but he was kind of working on this, uh, you know, a lot until he died. And he, like I said, the website is still there if you want to go uh, read all his letters and stuff. Um, the interesting thing is that I think... And a lot of, it seems like a lot, of, a lot of other people who have looked really deep into this case kind of feel like the same thing. I think this is too, not unrelated necessarily, but two separate 
incidents. I think the first letters that arrived um, that accused Mary Gillespie of having an affair with Gordon Massey, the superintendent of schools, I think that maybe a few of them came from Gordon, Gordon Massey's son. Although I don't know, you know, it wasn't all of them and it, and maybe it wasn't any of them because he did maybe have a reason to, but he was a teenager. It's like, why would he care that much? He wasn't the letter writer because there's no way he'd send like a thousand letters, like no teenage boy would do that. So maybe he wrote a couple of them, maybe not. I think the initial letters accusing her of the affair came from a coworker of hers whose name was David Longberry. Now, David Longberry, allegedly, um, I'm not sure what his job was, but he might have been another bus driver. He worked in the school system and he knew her. Allegedly, he um, had a, a, cr a big crush on her and had asked her out and she had said no and then started sleeping with Gordon Massey. So there was some jealousy issues there. That sounds like that, sounds like that might be a good And it suspect. sounds like he kind of had a motive. Yeah. So I feel like the first series of letters that were all like, uh, that were directed at her and directed at Ron Gillespie saying, well, why don't you report the affair to the school board, do something about it, or I'm going to kill your daughter, that kind of stuff. I kind of feel like that was probably Longberry. Now, it should be noted that many years later, I believe it was in 1999, David Longberry was sought for raping an 11 year old girl. Hmm. He was staying in his house with like this elderly couple and the 11 year old girl was their granddaughter. And this guy allegedly rapes this girl while the grandparents are in the house. Yeah. Hmm. So they were looking for him for that and he went on the run and ended up hanging himself hmm. later on. This I think was in 1999. So this guy, obviously not the most stable individual. Yeah. So I'm kind of feeling like hmm. the original Circleville letters were probably from him, the block letter ones. And then, you know, after, Ron Gillespie died, which I kind of suspect was maybe just a weird coincidence and it was just like an accident. Um, I kind of feel like I don't know, like about the gun being discharged. That seems a little weird, but I mean, it could just How be. How do that, they know when that gun was discharged? Right. You don't know when. It might have been like, discharged weeks or months right. before. Or it's like he might have just shot out the window because he was mad or, you know, he yeah. was drunk, apparently. Yeah. So, you know, there could have been a million reasons why that might have happened. I don't necessarily think that he was murdered or that had anything to do with it. I think that the letter writer, who I'm assuming is David Longberry, called him and said something that pissed him off so yeah. much yeah. that he said, I'm going to go get this guy. He probably told him where he was. Just come down here and meet me. Yeah, come down here and meet me. I got to tell you something yeah, or something yeah, like that. And he's yeah. like, I'm going to go get this motherfucker. Yeah. Got his gun. And maybe he even drank like for courage or whatever. Yeah. Or he was already drunk and he was just inclined to like go off. And I think he just got in an accident. I don't yeah. think that was a murder. I don't think anything like that. Now, I think after that happened, after um, Paul Freshour and Karen, his wife, got divorced in, the, in 1982, which was by all accounts a very, very acrimonious divorce. I think she decided, because she knew about the letters, she'd read them, like when they were still married, you know, when they were over at the Gillespie's house. So she said, I'm gonna use that, you know, to frame Paul Fresher because she was pissed off at him. He got the house, he got the kids. Mm. Um, and Martin Yant, who was the investigative journalist who worked on this many years later, said that he had talked to her and she was a very angry, very vindictive woman. Mm. And he said, and it's very interesting that she didn't say anything about Paul Freshour being the Circleville writer until after the divorce. Hmm. He's like, if she really thought that, why didn't he say, why didn't she say that in the divorce hearing? Right. Like that she thought, but she didn't say anything about that. There's no mention of it. Hmm. It was only after the divorce and after that happened that, you know, that she went off and said, oh, he wrote all those letters and he tried to kill Mary Gillespie with the booby trap and all this other kind of shit. So I kind of suspect, like I said, this is two separate incidents. I think the first one was the was the jealous guy, the coworker that loved Mary Gillespie and was mad that she'd started an affair with another guy. So she was so he was trying to out her, you know, get her in trouble with her husband, break up her marriage. And or the whatever. husband got killed, and he had no recourse, no way to stop it. Right, and yeah. then you know the husband got killed, which, like I said, right. was probably just like a strange coincidence. Um, and so <laughs> the letters kind of stopped after that. But then I think after. The fresh hours got divorced. I think Karen said, I'm going to use that letter writer thing yeah. and just make everybody think it's the same person hmm. um, and frame. And because here's the thing, 
Karen used to live in the house with Paul Freshour, obviously because they were married. She knew where that gun was. Hmm. How easy would it be to go in the garage? Because she knew that her husband didn't like really use it. He just kept it stashed in there. How easy would it be for her to take it and then sort of half acidly try to scrape the thing off? So it's like, oh, well, I'm trying to hide right. who it, whose gun it is, but not really. You know what I mean? It would be easier for her to do that. Right. And I think she probably recruited her boyfriend at the time, whose name I do not know. I didn't see it in, in anywhere. Um, I think she recruited her boyfriend at the time to help her do that. So they would be able to frame him. Hmm. Now, I forgot to mention too, that when Unsolved Mysteries was doing, was researching the, uh, you know, the segment about this case, they got a Circleville letter, right? Uh, letter too. It okay. was like an anonymous postcard. And it said, forget Circleville, Ohio. Um, and then it said something like, don't hurt Sheriff Ratcliffe. I don't uh, know why it would have said that. Trying to frame him. Yeah, but, um, but then it also said, uh, you, if you, I can't remember what it said, but it said something like, if you do the story, like you, you L sickos will pay. Yeah. And then it was signed the Circleville writer. Yeah. I think Karen wrote that. And a lot of other researchers on the internet seem to agree with me. I think that, I think Karen wrote that. But as far as I know, that was the last one. Um, but like I said, this is like, <laughs> this is the weirdest fucking case. Like it has yeah. so many moving parts to it. And, you know, like I said, I think it was just two things two, that kind of got right. conflated into one right. thing. But I definitely think there was at least two letter writers, possibly three. It's a real case, three. and then it became a copycat case later. Right. So, yeah. you know, like I said, yeah. I, I'm not saying I don't know if Gordon Massey's son wrote any of the letters, because a couple of them did have uh, different handwriting and were signed with a W. So he might have written a few of them. But um, I, I don't think, I mean, I think mostly it was the co-worker and then later Karen mm. took up, or Karen or the boyfriend, you know, they were working in tandem to try to get Paul Fresh out in trouble, which actually worked because he was in prison for 10 years. And then even after he got out and he was trying to get the FBI to investigate and he was trying to get her prosecuted and all this other kind of stuff. And as far as I know, that never went anywhere. Hmm. Um, and he passed away. So like I said, this is like a fucking strange case. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of really cool shit out there about it. Um, there's shit. I've there was a really good podcast um, on The Trail Went Cold. Mm -hmm. uh, he did a lot of really good research about it. It's about an hour long. Um, and that's really good. So I would recommend listening to that. But you know, I think going through most of this, I think most of the other people that have researched the case have come to a similar conclusion, conclusion okay. as what I did. Now, some more conspiracy might say, oh, maybe Ron Gillespie, maybe that was a murder, which it could have been. But I'm kind of leaning toward no, I'm kind of leaning toward it was just an accident. And it just hmm. it just seemed weird because it was such a coincidence that he had been threatened and him and his wife had been threatened and then he ended up dead. Um, you know, so could it have been a murder? Yeah, but it seemed like a really convoluted way to murder somebody yeah and honestly the booby trap thing i'm not sure if that was even intended to go off you know what i mean yes it's still attempted murder but i think that if karen and the boyfriend put that booby trap there i don't think they really intended it for it to go off and kill mary gillespie i think they just put it there to scare her you know what i mean yeah because they would have done a better job you would think i mean i heard that the boyfriend was kind of like a tinkery kind of guy right. like he knew how to do that kind of shit so if he if he would have made a booby trap he would have that, would have made that was more supposed to one. work right yeah. so i just kind of feel like that was put there to frighten her all right into whatever but yeah so that's that case like i said there's a ton of really good shit about this because so it's probably about time to take a break then it probably is yeah um okay. but yeah so we're gonna take a break right now uh, right at the halfway point. And when we come back, we're going to talk about yet another uncaught serial killer, the doodler from 1970s, San Francisco. The doodler. I know, that poor guy. <laughs> well, not poor guy, he's a serial killer, but it's like, I, I kind of wish, I kind of wish that uh, the media would give more serial killers names like that because yeah. then maybe they'd knock it off. That sounds like something out of old, the old Batman series. And next, the doodler. Yeah. <laughs> You know what's yeah. funny is I was watching a documentary yeah. about this on YouTube and somebody commented that exact same thing. Yeah, yeah. They said it sounds exactly like a Batman villain. Yeah. And it's like maybe they should give they should give more serial killers like goofy ass nicknames yeah. like that. Maybe they wouldn't do it as much. But yeah, so we're gonna take a break right now and we'll be back in just a few minutes.
Okay, everybody, Jenny's got some new shirt designs up, four of them, really good ones too. Atlanta Ripper, who put Bella in the Witch Elm, the H.H. H. Holmes Murder Castle, and of course, Demon Child, because man said he could. These are updated designs. I think they look really cool. Jenny did a great job on them. Really fun making, Jenny? They were very fun. And thank you very much. I think they came out very good. Yeah, they get really good. They're very high quality shirts. Jenny and I wear shirt, uh, our own shirts at, at certain times when we're trying to put a spotlight on ourselves. And you can put a spotlight on yourselves. If you go ahead and pick up one of these shirts today, you guys are going to love them. Links in the description, www.zazzle.com at 13 o'clock. Yeah, so go check out our store at www.zazzle.com slash 13 o'clock. We got these four cool new t-shirt designs, plus all our old ones, if you'd rather get one of the old ones. But these ones are awesome, and you should check them out. They're also available in women's cut, and they look really cute. Jenny's got some. So thank you. Go check them out. Okay, we're back, and now we're discussing the second case on our true crime twofer. This is a serial killer called the Doodler, sometimes called the Black Doodler because he was reportedly an African American man. This is another one of those serial killers. Black guy was doodling. Yeah, well, we're, we're, like we're I said, say, I'll, I'll get say. to why they call him the Doodler. <laughs> but, I mean, there is a reason they didn't yeah. just call him that for shits and giggles. This is another one of those ones because remember that show we did about the Atlanta Ripper. And I was just kind of like, man, this guy killed like all these people and yet hardly anybody has ever heard of him. And the same thing kind of applies with the doodler. Um, he sort of comes up on a lot of these kind of like creepy, like under, you know, underknown serial killers and stuff like that. But there's not a hell of a lot of information yeah. about the case. And we got a good shirt on the Atlanta Ripper. Jenny made a really cool one. That's up there now, right? Should yeah, be it's easy Because we fixed, we fixed uh, uh, the, shirt, the shirt channel. Yeah, Zazzle. Zazzle, yeah. We, yeah, had, we had that one messed up. Well, was like, it wasn't messed up. I, I just like, had to Google why, why they weren't coming up. They weren't coming said, up. They said they were public, and yet people were... Yeah. Like, half the people were saying they couldn't see them, and half the people yeah. were saying they could see There's them. There's a I rating. You had to rate them for, for G. See, I never would have guessed yeah. that. How do we know? I, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah. So I had to Google it. So yeah, you can up. see it there. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so it, looks like a, it looks like a Jack the Ripper theme. But this is a similar kind of thing. This is like another serial killer that... You know, there were a lot of them in the 70s, particularly in California, where this uh, took place as well. And it seems like, you know, uh, serial killers that even had less victims than this guy ostensibly did uh, are a lot better known. So, again, I think I there's probably some reasons for that. I might get into that a little bit later. But so this guy, apparently his reign of terror uh, went from early 1974 to about fall of 1975. Um, he's usually credited with 14 murders and three attempted murders, like three people escaped. However, whenever you look him up, there are only five named victims. So I'm not sure because here's the problem. This particular serial killer targeted almost exclusively, as far as they know, gay men in the Castro district of San Francisco in the 1970s, when it was still not cool to be gay, even in San Francisco. The problem was at this time period and in this particular place, a lot of gay men were um, you know, coming to San Francisco because it was more welcoming than where they were coming from, which didn't say a lot. But the problem was the more of them came there, the more killers seemed to target them. I mean, there was a, an alarming amount of gay men murdered in this time period, in this area. Yeah, we're killing them like it was legal. Right, it, it, pretty yeah. much. It's just yeah. kind of like, I mean, anytime you have a marginalized community, I think the same thing happened with the Atlanta Ripper because yeah. they were all black women. The same thing happened with uh, the case of the Freeway Phantom because yeah. all the victims were black girls. Um, you know, same thing happened with, um, 
you know, Highway of Tears and stuff like that because they're mostly they were um, indigenous yeah, women. It wasn't the good old days. This shit went on into the eighties too, right? You know? So when when your victims come from a sort of marginalized community or a community that a lot of people don't have sympathy for or empathy for. Um, you're not going to get a lot of investigation yeah. into the matter. And I think that was kind of what happened in this case. A lot of it has to do with also just like the police workforce and, and, and what their manpower requirements were. That to too. Man hour uh, requirements. Because Jen and I were talking about it earlier. Really, you know, the, the crime was so bad in the United States during the 70s and 80s. And even certain times in the past, like back in the 20s and the 30s, it kind of came and, came and went in these weird, weird waves. Well, uh, you know, it wasn't an information society. There was no internet. There was no social media or anything like that. It was a bunch of isolated individuals inside a city. You had a police force that was trying to maintain law and order against a, just a wave, a crime wave. So really, they, they couldn't control the crime. You know, it, it's a joke to think they could control the crime. So what they did is they just kind of prioritized it. Yeah, they had to triage. Yeah, so depending on who they, the victims were. They sadly. went directly to the rich people, protect the rich people, because that's who's given. That's who employs the police. All right. Yeah. And the taxpayers, because if you can protect the taxpayers, then you can get reelected. All right. So uh, people who didn't pay taxes or people who were not making much money were way down low on the priority. There was just no way. You know, they could barely take care of the middle class and the upper class. Really, they could. They just kind of made a show of taking care of them because they got killed too. But if you were uh, if you were poor, you were fucked. Basically, well, you were on your own. I think that's always been the case. Which, human history. yeah. <laughs> In the You're end, pretty much always fucked. I don't really care what your mindset is or what your you know your value system is. In the end, you got to protect yourself. That's just the way it is. I think the same thing. Yeah. I think that's why they never caught the Cleveland Torso right. murder. Because they're like, eh, he's just targeting like people at a hobo camp. Who gives a shit? Yeah, like, yeah. They were nuisances anyway. We can't, and, you know, we're not making any money off those people and they cause crimes and he's killing people yeah. that cause crimes. And I think and, the same thing happens you know. when serial killers target prostitutes. I mean, yeah. unless they unless they rack up a significant body count and people start complaining, you know, then it's like, oh, kill a couple prostitutes. No yeah. one's going to care. It took a long... It's terrible, but it's. I think that's the truth. You got to look at Gary Ridgway, you know. He was killing those girls going way back. Exactly. But it didn't become a priority uh, until the crime wave kind of subsided and technology kind of caught up. And they said, you know what? Remember that guy's been killing the Green River guy? We, we, we should probably catch that guy. We can now. Yeah. We have time to catch him. So they, they caught him. And I think that's uh, kind of happened a lot. You know, and we kind of go a lot into the original Night Stalker case and everything, you know, particularly since they just caught him recently through DNA. And now they're going back trying to catch the Zodiac and stuff. And it should be noted, too, that the Doodler is one of the cases that is it's been open the whole yeah. time. They never closed it. But um, he's one of the people that they're trying to catch yeah. now that they have the DNA. A lot of uh, times we technology. come at these cases, you know, it kind of sounds fucked up. It kind of sounds bad that certain people are marginalized and they don't get police protection. It's not that it's mean. It's just, it's just that the system just can't deal with the shit. That's really what it is. You're well, on your own. Like I said, during times of high crime, yeah, particularly time during the 1970s. It was bad back and then. And like I said, particularly at this period in San Francisco, California, like I said, yeah. a lot of people were moving there. And there was, you know, a lot of serial killers were operating. The Zodiac yeah. was still around. There was, like, a lot of serial killers operating. And I feel like they couldn't really get a handle on it. So they're just like, oh, somebody's killing a bunch of gay dudes. Eh. Yeah. They didn't really care. Because, like I said, you know, yes. They had to triage the situation. Right. Like, the doodler is attributed, yeah. like I said, he's attributed with 14 murders, three attempted murders. But there were a lot more gay men murdered yeah. during that period that that were other people. What they tended so to do. So he wasn't the only one targeting that community. What the police tended to do in situations like this is they'd go to those gay bars and they'd show pictures around of guys that came up missing or they thought they were dead and they would just say, "Hey, gay dudes, somebody's killing y'all. You guys yeah. better watch yourselves. We can't stop it." That's really how they would kind of. Well, the shitty tell thing them. too, and I read yeah. a lot. They would um, do the same thing with the hookers. They would say, "Hey, yeah. hookers, guys out there killing you guys. You guys need to stop being hookers. We can't protect you." Yeah. You're getting into cars with guys and some of these guys are killers. Although I should note yeah. that the police force at the time, reportedly, uh, according to a lot of the kind of gay papers and stuff like that at the time, were accusing the police. Uh, evidently, the police had time to uh, essentially cruise through the gay neighborhoods and entrap people 
But they didn't like have the, to, yeah. But they didn't have time to catch people that were no. like killing them. So that's nice. Well, the yeah, friends... they would come through and be like, "Hey, baby, uh, why don't you get in the car?" Blah blah blah. Because yeah. homosexuality, like I said, still illegal at the time. Yeah. So they would cruise through and like try to well, get somebody to proposition them, and then they would arrest them. Well, you know why? That was quick and easy. That didn't require any well, yeah, kind of the, investigation. They didn't have to work. And then you you could actually get fines out of them right. and make money off of that in the courts. Yeah. It's law enforcement is is a business. Well, yeah. It's a business. It's just like everything. That's else. why, you know. It's all about the money. <laughs> you're, you've are you got to be, you've got to protect yourself. Sorry, we sound you've cynical. You've got to protect yourself. you got to be cynical. Police are not really. Didn't Lily Tomlin say that? No, you, yeah. As cynical as you get, it's still yeah. not, you're still not cynical you're still enough. Not cynical, right. <laughs> I think Pro- she said Cover that. your own ass. <laughs> uh. But yeah, so like I said, even though he's attributed with 14 murders, um, usually only five of them are named. Now, the first one was a guy named Gerald Cavanaugh. Now, he was 49. He was originally from Canada. They don't know a great deal about him. Um, specifically, it just said, you know, when they found him, it was, oh, never married, whatever. They just found him on January 24th, 1974, uh, lying on Ocean Beach in San Francisco, and he had been stabbed multiple times. Uh, he did have self-defense wounds. Um, one thing that the doodler seemed to do, his kind of MO was to stab people both in the front and in the back. What he would do and why they call him the doodler, allegedly, is he would go into the gay bars in the Castro district and he would ingratiate himself with people by going, hey, let me draw a portrait of you or a caricature of you. And people would be like, oh, okay, cool. And he would draw pictures of them like on his little sketchbook or on a cocktail napkin or what have you. And then he would kind of like, you know, talk to them and he was charming and everything like that. He'd be like, oh, let's go somewhere to a park or to a beach or, you know, drive me somewhere in your car. And then he would end up stabbing them to death multiple times. Hmm. So that was kind of the thing that he would do. And like I said, that's why they called him the doodler. No because signs he of would sexual assault. Um, I don't think there was. Um, did, they, did he make out with the guys before he killed them? I don't know. Um, some sources say yes, some say no. Uh, I never saw anything that said any of them were sexually assaulted. Um, I, you know, and there were three people. I'm trying to figure out if he's gay. Um, I think now, he is. No, because they think the the few people that escaped him that were willing to say something, even though they didn't want to be outed, uh, yeah. particularly at the time, and they, so they wouldn't let their names be known, because a couple of them were evidently quite famous or quite well known. Or probably married. Um, yeah, it might have been. Um, so they actually said they thought that he was probably straight. The uh, interesting thing about it, like I said, most serial killers, um, you know, just like they said in Silence of the Lambs, most serial killers tend to hunt within their own ethnic groups. This man did not. Uh, reportedly, this was uh, an African-American man. Uh, most reports said that he was very upper middle class. He seemed very educated. Um, he was uh, very nicely dressed. He told a couple of them that he was studying commercial art. Um, they said he seemed very, you know, he was he was very tall, slim, qu- quite handsome, uh, you know, and he was, you know, good talker, smooth talker, stuff like that. So, but all of his victims, so not as far rat. as I know, not were white. About, as yeah. far as I know, all of his victims were white. But that white. was his social class. He wasn't a hood rat. He was right. in the middle class. But for some most, reason, he had some kind of a... I, see, here's the thing that's breaking breaking down for me. Why is he going after gay guys? Usually, usually a serial killer goes after his intended sexual target really. again i think that's why this guy is unusual because by all accounts uh most some of the people that escaped his clutches and they uh the cops actually had an unnamed suspect that they think was probably him but they didn't have enough evidence to um to convict him so that he got let go um he would say things like apparently he was a gay hater or he had some kind of but most of the people that escaped uh perceived him to be straight they did not think that he was uh, a gay guy at all so that is another kind of thing that makes him unusual. I think he sounds like, if you ask me. Or he might have been a self He's a self-loathing. Self- yeah, he might have been, he's sure. He's a self-loathing gay. Because evidently he was in therapy. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it was for that issue particularly, if it was the suspect that they were talking about. He was gay and he liked white guys and was blaming them for his gayness. That's what I think was going on. That, yeah, that's you probably bitch, a pretty how astute... You bi- yeah, you bitch, how dare you, attra- how dare you be attracted be, to me? Right. I'm going to kill you for making me gay. That's what he said. That's, that's what's probably, going on. Yeah, because I do feel like a lot that's of... That's what's going well, on. Well, a lot of serial killers, the people who do this type of thing, the men yeah. who do this type of thing, yeah. they usually see their victims as like... They blame them blame for them. their feelings. Exactly. That's what's going on. So I do feel like there might be some of that going on. How dare you be hot? I'm going to fucking kill you. Yeah. Making me gay. <laughs> that might have been it. it yeah, been. I think, yeah. 
Now, it might go back to something to where maybe there was some kind of a molestation that went on between a gay guy when he was younger, and it kind of tripped some switches, and maybe he started to started to kind of like that. So maybe it was like he liked it and he didn't like it at the same time, maybe. Yeah. Well, particularly back then, like like I said, I feel like this is probably why it's better now because it's like, you know, no one cares if you're gay anymore. It's like, you know, it's fine just to just... Yeah, it's like, main, it's like just, mundane now. Well, yeah, it's just like you do you. Nobody yeah, it, really that, gives yeah. a shit. I mean, and anybody that would give a shit is not worth listening to anyways. Yeah. So I feel like maybe back in the day when it was still like when it was still illegal when it was still like looked down upon you could really get into some that's self-loathing and horrible like guilt kind of shit that would make you do some fucked that, up shit later that was on. that was like toby toby says oh man i liked it back <laughs> he says i liked it back when being gay was subversive well toby, I, toby was like I can says, understand anybody that be because, gay now? well i can understand that because yeah. You know, you know, we come from the goth subculture, yeah, we, and we've been in it since the '80s. So there was something kind of a lot cooler when, like, nobody really knew what it was. Because I mean, when I was yeah. in high school, everyone just thought it was a Satanist. Nobody would have yeah. knew what a goth. Now was. goths are everywhere. Now there's like goths everywhere. It's like you see it on, you know, Paris yeah. runways, and you see that it in is. movies, and it's not weird anymore. Yeah. So I can see like a lot of the yeah. fun and, and for like some leather daddy, the rebellion's been taken yeah. out of it. You know what I mean? But buddy, buddy, of mine's a leather daddy. You know, and uh, we love Toby. He's yeah, awesome. and. Uh, he says there's just too many gay people. He doesn't like them now. He says it's mainstream. <laughs> he says it's mainstream. Well, because he's, he's super into like goth and industrial too. So he's, yeah, so he, it's a kind of a he's like the thing. he's like a Rob Halford. He's like he's like the, he's like the gothic Rob Halford. He and is, he's yeah. just like get up, these fuckers. <laughs> yeah, he's and he's. I can't repeat in his what 50s, he says. It, he's in yeah, his fifties. Yeah, he? yeah, yeah. He's he's older. Yeah, than we are. He's he doesn't serious. look it, but he's yeah, doesn't look it, but he's older than we are. But yeah, it's the same type of thing. And like I said, it's the same thing with the goth subculture. It's yeah. like what it's like once it loses that underground. It's you know, it's kind of yes. like what happened to like Forty Second Street in New yeah. York. It's like oh, it used to be all CD with all the porn yeah. theaters and yeah. you know all the fucking grindhouse and yeah. stuff like that. Now it's just like a tourist trap. You right. know what I mean? It's it's kind of like that. Like yeah, it was yucky and dirty and crime ridden but there was some but it was kind of for the hardcore few yeah it was like there was still some kind of romance about it yeah, that's yeah. gone now yeah um so it's the same thing with the goth subculture probably the same thing in the gay uh subculture at according, least according to at toby. least according to you toby know, and the leather daddies to friends of ours yeah. that that are because you know we have a lot of friends that are gay that say that similar kind of thing it's like oh it used to be more fun back in the day ones ones that are our age and older yeah and they're goths though yeah and it's uh it's, so they're, there might they're be not some normal of that they're, they're not normal gay people they don't they look at no, normal gay people look at them like they're freaks yeah. They're like, you well, know. Well, it's just kind of like we always, the way they dress we always look shit. at normal people. Yeah. Like, askance. Yeah. <laughs> or I always have. Because I feel like they're hiding something. That's what <laughs> I mean. I, I always feel like it's the normal ones you got to watch. But yeah, so okay. So Gerald Cavanaugh is generally named as the first victim of the doodler, as I said. Stabbed to death in January of 1974. The next one was uh, much younger. He was 27. His name was Joseph Stevens. Now, he was actually better known as Jay. Um, he was actually quite well known in San Francisco because he was a uh, he was a well known uh, female impersonator and comedian. Uh, he had a recurring gig at a place called Finocchio's, which was a club that had been there since the 1930s. Um, so he was kind of well known. He was seen uh, alive. They think that he probably drove whoever the killer was to the spot where he was discovered. This happened in June of 1974. Um, again, he was found, uh, on the shores of Spreckles Lake and had been stabbed, uh, multiple times. I think it was three times and they had found blood like in his nose and mouth, indicating that he had been stabbed in the lungs. Um, the next victim was actually a German American man by the name of Klaus Christman, Klaus Christman. Now he actually had a wife and kids back in Germany, but he had been living in the United States with some friends for about three months, uh, at the time that he was murdered. Um, he was found dead on July 7th, 1974. He had actually, uh, his death was um, insanely violent. He'd been stabbed many, many times, particularly in the throat. He was found fully clothed. The reason they think that he was maybe a quote unquote closet gay was because they found an unspecified tube of makeup in his pocket. So I don't know if it was lipstick or concealer or whatever. But from that, they determined that maybe he was a closeted That's gay That's a man. stretch, but whatever. That's what I was thinking. I was just like, really? But, you know, back then they're like, he has a tube of whatever. He or yeah. It was probably just like chapstick or some shit probably like that. Probably eyeliner. Or yeah, or maybe eyeliner. something like that. It's like, 
like I said, I'm very skeptical of yeah. that type of shit. But like I said, Goth yeah. gonna laugh at that shit. Yeah. Well, yeah, Eyeliner right? means you're gay. Yeah, know, it's really. like wow. Then I've tell been that gay. To every... I've been gay forever. I know. <laughs> tell that to Just every to... fucking guy. Back when I was young and pretty, I'd put my fucking eye out on my powder. He looks and really good look in Just eyeliner, like you fucking guys. look like something straight out of Duran Duran. He looked good in eyeliner. Yeah, yeah. And one and and a guy that I used to have a really terrible crush on back way back in high school, like yeah. back in the nineteen eighties, he always wore eyeliner. Yeah. And yeah, I it love was that a thing guy. back then, back in the eighties and the nineties. Yeah, yeah, I love that kind of thing. Yeah. Some dudes can pull it off. I, I mean, only do it for special events. Remember, like when we went to the Vampire Ball. Yeah, like what? Yeah. yeah, it's like he doesn't usually, but yeah, if, if it's a big anymore. special occasion, yeah, yeah, he'll do it. But and like I said, it looks very Shit, good. Man, back in the day, fucking dudes would go to the prom with eyeliner in the fucking in the fucking tuxedos and shit. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. And that, yeah, that was back in the late 80s. You still but, got, yeah. I mean, you know, at least where I, like, I went to school in Central Florida, so it's it was still yeah. very rednecky here. So people were like, oh, faggot. Yeah. And they still got beat up and stuff, but it's like, yeah. Yeah. So uh, because this guy had a, like I said, unspecified makeup tubes, they just assume, oh, well, maybe he's a closeted gay too, but whatever. So uh, actually, he was murdered. They shipped his body back to Germany to be buried. He is considered the third victim of the doodler. The next one was found in May of 1975. His name was Frederick Capen, and he was 32. Um, he had actually also been stabbed in the heart. Now, they identified a couple of these other, uh, the previous victims, they didn't identify them right away because for a while they were John Doe's. This guy they identified right away because he had actually, um, he was a nurse, and he had actually served in Vietnam. He had several medals of commendation for saving many of his compatriots in Vietnam. Uh, so his fingerprints were on record with the uh, with the army or whatever, or the navy rather. So they knew who he was. Um, yeah. So he was the next one uh, that ha that was murdered. And then the fifth named victim was named Harold Gulberg. Now he was much older. He was 66 years old. Um, he was originally Swedish, although he had lived in this country for quite a long time. Uh, also a sailor. Um, I believe he'd been in the Swedish Navy. He had like the tattoos and everything like that. Interestingly, this one was a little bit different because all the other victims had been found fully clothed. Um, this one, he was fully clothed, but his pants were unzipped. And if he had been wearing underwear, they were missing. So they don't know if the killer took them. No, nah, he was going or commando. Or if he just didn't he have didn't any to start with. Because it's a common it, military thing well, called it, going commando. Literally. Well, yeah, everybody knows that it's called going commando. But yeah. that, that's the thing that kills me. It's just like I always, because I've written about a couple cases, uh, a couple true crime cases in my book where they were talking about how weird it was that people didn't wear underwear. And I'm like, a lot of people don't wear underwear. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to straighten this out what going commando. I don't wear underwear. What I don't going, want VPL. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to straighten this shit out about why it's called going commando. Why fuck it. All right, I'm ex-infantry, if, if those you don't know. All right. You're in the field and you're in the infantry. You're usually carrying a rucksack. If it's hot, you're fucking sweating constantly. There's no such thing as a shower. You might be out there 30 days. All right. And underwear is just going to fucking catch sweat and it's going to chafe badly so will hair soldiers tend to shave you know they tend to be porn star smooth all right well it's practical it's much more practical and you can clean yourself off with just one of those handy wipes yeah. the handy wipes come in the mre all right you're hot and back in those days we had long bdu shirts and that goes all the way back to the 70s and the 60s the long bdu type shirts if you got really hot, you could unbutton your fly. There's no zippers on military trousers, just buttons. All right, but you can't see it. To get you a added ventilation. Go on commando. No underwear. Yeah. No underwear and shaved. And like I said, that's yeah. it's really weird that like, I don't know, it's really weird that people just assume that other people wear underwear. It's like a lot yeah, of people no, don't wear underwear. No, and then, you know. Even back then. Like you, I said, you do, especially like in the 70s in, with in, the tight pants. If you're you living in the wild, actually, and you're a commando... Without underwear is cleaner than with underwear. Yeah. You can clean yourself a lot easier, a lot faster. Better yeah. ventilation. And, like I said, it just it just yeah. seems to me weird that people would assume that everybody just wears underwear. Yeah. Because they don't. Uh -uh. <laughs> so this guy, like I said, I don't know if the killer necessarily took his underwear. If he just wasn't wearing any, maybe he just didn't wear he any. Was, say, he was military. He was, he was going commando. That's what I mean, yeah. And also, he was also, he was European also. Mm -hmm. I mean, he'd lived here for a long time, but mm -hmm. he was European to start with. So at this stage, like I said, they suspect that the doodler killed 14 people, but those five are usually the only ones named. I presume that the other nine people that they never name uh, were other gay men that were murdered at the time that had a similar MO, like I said, stabbed in the front and the back, usually stabbed in the heart, stabbed in the throat, something like that. Um, and they usually found them because I believe the last victim, Harold Goldberg, they actually didn't find him for two weeks. They said he'd been laying out on this, 
you know, where they found him for two weeks and like his face was all covered with maggots and stuff like that. It's just this horrible, horrible thing. But that was considered his last victim. Now, interestingly, apparently the cops knew who it was or had a very strong suspect. Evidently, they brought this guy in and they wanted to prosecute him. He didn't confess to any of the crimes, but they thought he was a pretty, like, he looked very much like the, um, like the composite sketch that they made of him. Um, and, you know, he had a similar kind of thing. But the problem was that the allegedly three people who were attacked by him and lived did not want to out themselves by testifying against him in court. Because one of these people was apparently a European diplomat who had been uh, visiting San Francisco at the time. He was stabbed six times in his apartment, but he survived. Um, no one knows who that is. Um, another one was a quote unquote, uh, well-known entertainer. Um, the gay community has speculated that it could be Richard Chamberlain, uh, could be Sal Mineo, um, could be a lot of other actors who um, were gay, but it wasn't cool to be out about it back then. So they were kind of keeping it on the DL. Um, but they don't know entirely who that is either. Now the cops, it seemed like they sort of blamed the community a little bit for it's like, why we can't prosecute this guy because you guys won't come out and tell everybody that you're gay, um, in order to put this guy in prison. Um, very famously, Harvey Milk, uh, you know, the very famous, uh, you know, early gay politician who was later assassinated uh, by another politician. Uh, if you haven't seen the movie Milk, it's very good and check it out. Um, he actually came out and said that he understood why they were doing that. He's like most of the, you know, gay men in San Francisco, you know, most of them are still in the closet and their entire livelihoods, their relationships, everything could be lost if they came out and testified against this guy. He's like, so even though it would be nice if we would catch this guy, I can understand why people don't want to testify against him because their lives would essentially be ruined. So as I said, the cops said that they knew who this guy was. This guy apparently might have also assaulted a police officer, but I, I don't know. A couple of sources said that as well. But because they claimed that they couldn't get any people to testify against him, then they had to let him go because they didn't have sufficient evidence. They do have one single um, composite sketch of the suspect. He is said to be an African-American male, about six feet tall, uh, slender. Like I said, he was often uh, wore like a Navy watch style cap. Um, and they said that he said that he was studying commercial art, that he seemed very intelligent, very educated. Um, but that's about all they ever said. They never named the particular suspect that they had. Um, in, and as far as they know, after about autumn of 1976, uh, that he didn't kill any more people. Now in 1977, there were these two guys that they arrested. Um, they were from Redondo beach and Riverside, California, and they actually got questioned. There were a bunch more murders, like 28 of them to be specific. Um, that it happened after quote unquote homosexual encounters. Uh, these guys were also suspects in the Doodler case, but were also likewise never prosecuted or never indicted for these particular murders. Now, as I said, this guy, serial killer, suspected of killing at least 14 people, yet kind of not a lot of information exists about him, but the case is still open. And in May of 2018, um, the San Francisco Police Department came out and said, you know, this is one of the active investigations that we're trying to solve with the new DNA stuff, <coughs> just like we did with, you know, original Night Stalker and the other crimes that they are uh, still investigating. So we'll see if the doodler ever gets caught. I mean, because he was pretty young. He's not. In the 70s, but and we'll see how that goes. They won't catch him. Maybe not. No, I think so. He's probably dead. It, yeah, possibly. I mean, like I said, it seemed like he did a run, but it's hard to say because, like I said, so many gay men got murdered during these particular years, like the mid to late 70s, particularly in this area of California, that they're not entirely sure how many people he killed. It might have been just those five. He came from money. I'll tell you that. That's gonna. That's the They giveaway. do think he did, yeah. He came from money. Yeah. 
or he wouldn't have been able to move in those circles. They wouldn't have been attracted to him if he didn't come from money. He'd have to, in those days, yeah, he'd have to carry himself well. So, he came from money. In, you, could, you can't fake it. Those guys see well, through all that. interestingly, too, is that I was reading this really long, um, I can't remember who wrote it, but this really long um, write-up about it. And he was kind of like... Um, talking about he had interviewed like a lot of people that uh lived in the area at the time uh that were closeted at the time and um he said it's interesting just how the mainstream press pretty much ignored it um he's like the gay press kind of kept up on it but you know after the last victim was killed it kind of just you know then uh, you know a few years after that that's when the aids epidemic started so you know all the news kind of went to that and he's like plus there were so many murders of gay men that it's almost like you couldn't keep up with all of it um, he's like the interesting thing. He's like the race thing was an issue because he's like, particularly back then. And I had never heard this term before, but he's like, if you had a black man, like coming into the gay clubs and stuff like that, and you yeah. were kind of seen with them, you would become known as like the dinge queen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you were going after the black guys. So like yeah. you said, he must've been very yeah. smooth talking. He must've, you know, everything, like I, I said, guarantee all the... you, he wasn't from there. He was from another state. He was yeah. visiting that area and working in that area and doing this for a while. And then I think it got too hot and he left. Interestingly, he usually seemed to target immigrants or people who were not from there. Well, you know, you know what you're talking about, you know, these are kind of quote unquote quote exotic unquote gay guys. These are dudes from Europe. Yeah. So if you ask me, I think he was attracted to those guys. Could be. Yeah. I mean, like I said, other than the second victim, Joseph Stevens, who actually yeah. worked in the area and was yeah. actually quite well known, um, you know, he tended, the doodler tended to target men who were I got not a, from there. I got a feeling you, you, you need to look more towards the Midwest. Detroit, yeah. Gary, you know, in Ohio, yeah. Cincinnati area. That's probably where he was from. Well, like I said, there was such um, there was money. There, there was such an influx into yeah. San Francisco at the time, particularly the gay yeah. community, because, like I said, they perceived that it was like more welcoming than right. wherever they were from. There was money in the in that area in the black community for a certain time around the seventies. It was vanishing. He would have moved yeah. to better pastures, but maybe his parents were wealthy or yeah. middle class at least. So then he go, goes out to San Francisco for a while, gets involved in this. Uh, gets it gets bad the aids epidemic hits he probably knows that maybe blood can kill you he leaves yeah. you know goes somewhere else could be because it seemed like a kind of a short yeah run he unless he killed there. more than they thought he wasn't from there he yeah. moved, i want to say detroit uh in, indiana or michigan indiana ohio around that area that's probably where he came i don't see i don't think he'd be from new york yeah. Because he would stand out as a New Yorker with his accent. That's why I'm, that's why oh, yeah, I'm saying that. Yeah, that's a good that. point, yeah. All right? So I'm just trying to put get into his mind. Yeah. Um, but you see, Midwest, the accent isn't strong and you can hide it. Yeah. And you can move into San Francisco and become a new person there and blend in. Which a lot of people were doing. Right. Obviously, Hard to do that from New York. Not all to become serial killers, right. but a few of them did. Right. Frighteningly enough. Because they would have said, well, he had a New York accent. He sounded Brooklyn or he sounded, you know. Yeah, that so would have stood out. Would have stood like out. Said. So yeah. I'm thinking Midwest. That's a, that's actually probably a good uh, surmise. Yeah. That's a good uh, thing. New Orleans, surmise. Mississippi, Alabama? Fuck no. That accent would stand out. Stand like, out a mile. Like, yeah. So, um, Southern accent. So yeah, Midwest yeah. is really Midwest. the only thing. I mean, other than those like hardcore like Minnesota yeah. accents. But yeah, okay. I do. I do kind of feel like that's probably uh, that's probably a good observation. But yeah, we'll see if they ever catch this guy. Like I said, case is still open, and it's one of the ones, or so they say, that they're trying to solve nowadays. Just like they're trying to solve the zodiac and everything like that with all the DNA. I don't know how very much, unlikely. I don't so. know how much DNA evidence they have on this case. Like I said, I don't know. There's not a hell of a lot of information about this, so I don't know how much DNA evidence they have. I don't know if any of the victims were sexually assaulted. It doesn't appear that they were. Um, and it also doesn't appear that a lot of them had sexual relations with, I, I mean, apparently the doodler killed them before any of that could occur. So I'm not I, really sure how much. Uh, he'd be in his 70s or had. his 80s. I think he's dead by now. He got away with it. Yeah, he, yeah, maybe he did, sadly. Yeah. 
But anyway, let's uh, wrap up the show. We've gone on for long enough, as we usually do. (laughs) So remember, if you like this show, do like, share, subscribe on all your social media and uh, share with all your friends and family and whoever else you want to share it with. If you'd like to financially support the show, you can go to our Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash 13 o'clock podcast, or go to our blog, which is 13 o'clock podcast.wordpress.com. And there's a link in the sidebar to a PayPal account if you'd like to give a one-time donation. Also check out our latest movie review, which was the 2001 film Frailty. Um, also check out our last matinee review in which we reviewed Johnny English Strikes Again, Hunter Killer, and Smallfoot. Uh, that was our yeah. week at the movies. Um, and that will probably do it for episode 116. We will see you next time. Bye.